I live in Oregon, but I work in New York City, and I go in every three months or so. And one of the things that I enjoy about New York is just being with all the different kinds of people who are there from all over the world, who are riding subways together, who are walking together, who are all races, ethnicities, um, sexual orientation, religions, everybody's there, and most of the time everybody gets along really well, and it just makes you feel good about the world. But there are reminders of lots of sadness in New York City, and, and one of them is that I still, uh, this is with my daughter's writing on Staten Island Ferry a few months ago, and you know, when I look on the, on the front and I look to where the Twin Towers were, I still can't believe that they're not there. And then I have friends who died in that, and I think about that experience and the fact that there's a lot of resilience in New York City, but there's a lot of vulnerability too, no matter whether you're poor or you're rich or what from you, you're an immigrant or you from this country. And uh, so one example of uh, kind of resilience and vulnerability that I think of when I see the Twin Towers that aren't there was the fellow who walked between the Twin Towers before they opened. And uh, this shot kind of always stuck in my mind that this guy not only walked across these things, but he was comfortable enough to do stuff like lay down on that wire, which is like crazy, right? <laughs> so he's at really high risk and very vulnerable, but he clearly is resilient in his mind that he can do this, and his physical body too, that he can balance. So one time I was coming home from the trip, and uh, there, I go there about every three months or so, and uh, I was watching this, this movie about that experience, and there's a shot in the film where the guy who's playing that person is lying up and he looks up and he sees this bird, you know, and, and it looked very peaceful to me, but then I remember that what's on either side of him <laughs> is a long ways down, right? But, uh, but looking up in the sky and kind of, the, you know, the way that this shot was stood up, it's like some kind of hope that something's, something's going on. And, you know, for for as long as humans have been around, they've thought about going up in the sky. So I'm going to take you through a little journey here of a couple of ideas and hopefully tie it up all in the end. But the first idea is this. So for many, many years, centuries, thousands of years, people dreamed of flying. And even, you know, 100 years ago, 110 years ago, this is all people could do. And when they flew in something like this, they usually died. They didn't know how to fly. And then a few years after that, due to kind of uh, realizing that some of the ideas that people had about how to fly before the, you know, in the past weren't very good, some folks from Ohio figured out how to fly and got the plane off the ground, but it only was off the ground for like a few seconds and then it stopped, right? But not too long after that, because they practiced a lot, they were able to get their plane up a lot, and of course over the next decades, planes changed a lot, so now there's a plane like this that brought me here, right? So this is an example of a technology that people dreamed about and wanted to do something, an, an intervention to take you from one place to another is an airplane. And it's a very uh, good invention, and it got me here safely, and hopefully will get me home safely. But the method that was used to develop that technology was a lot of people tinkering around for many hundreds of years and not knowing what the heck they were doing, but just trying things out. But they were interested and curious. And at a certain point uh, before the turn of the 20th century, these two brothers from Ohio got together and looked at the evidence that was around that had been documented, the li limited evidence, and other people were doing the same thing, but they got some insights that other people hadn't had, and they started to employ science, the method of scientific, the scientific method. But they didn't just do that. They came up with some ideas, and then they spent a lot of time practicing, because this is something that people who were trying to fly hadn't done much of. They theoretically thought, this is how we should do something, and now and then they might try to fly in a glider, but then many of those people would die, so they didn't do that very often. And, uh, but, but once the Wright brothers had a way to fly that they didn't crash all the time, but they did sometimes and almost died, uh, they practiced a lot and learned how to fly and they persisted. And what got us from that initial airplane to today 
was a lot of investment over the long run from a lot of people all over the world. So, that, so this initial idea ended up getting repeated many, many times in many different ways in many different environments and then technology upgraded over time so that I got here safely and I'll go home safely in a couple of days. So what is the result? Well, for every two billion miles flown, only two people die. So that's a really safe form of transportation. But the transportation that you all probably took today, an automobile, is not very safe compared to that, although it's a lot safer than it used to be. But if you look at these data, you could probably conclude, as the National Safety Council did, that planes are a safe and effective intervention, and it's certainly well utilized. Probably most people in this room have flown probably sometime in the last year. Is that true? And you're all here today? Well, cars. Cars were developing at the same time that airplanes were, and they started off kind of looking similarly. They kind of looked like bicycles, just like the Wright brothers were bicycle builders, and they used bicycle ideas to get to where they are. And cars advanced over the last 100 years as well. And lots of cars that we all drive around in today probably look kind of like this. But yet, in a car, you're much less safe. And uh, in fact, if you drive an, old, an older car versus a new car, a study in 2013 found that at that time, if your, if your car was like around five or seven years old, you had a 10% greater chance of dying in a bad crash than if it was a newer car. And if you had a car like my family, 71% greater chance. So you have an old car. It's not a good thing to be in an old car. And that's controlling for lots of variables. Of course, if you wear a seatbelt in a new car or an old car, the likelihood that you're going to survive is about the same. So there is, an in, a, in a really bad crash, this is looking at really bad crashes that led to fatalities. Now, for much of my adult life, we drove really bad cars because we didn't have much money. And so uh, one time I was driving, uh, I just dropped uh, three of my kids off at school, and I was in this old Toyota Corolla, and I came on a, a, a section of highway like this where it was backed up, and it was raining and foggy, kind of like last night. And I was sitting in the car and kind of annoyed because I needed to get somewhere. I, I think I was going to a meeting with some folks about a prison project I was working on. And um, as I was sitting there, I looked in my mirror, and I saw an object coming towards me very, very fast. And I was at the very end of a line, and the, the, we were backed up about a mile behind where you usually stop on this highway. And this thing coming at me was not stopping, so I realized this person is going to hit me, and I thought, I'm in a car that's old, and I, have, and I bet you the, uh, the airbag isn't going to open. And so I waited till right before I got hit and I took my foot off the brake and I grabbed the back of my head and I leaned down. And my car went from a station wagon to a little compartment. And uh, for about a year and a half, I had PTSD related to that, kept reliving it. So that was the first time I'd ever experienced that. But you know, I can still kind of feel what it was like you know, the smell, the seeing this flame come out, you know, this whole experience, which is really bad. And fortunately, none of us died in that wreck. But if I had not dropped my three kids off, they would be dead because the way that the car looked like was this. This was not my car, but this is what happened. And so the car seats were, scra uh, were scrunched. Um, the soccer ball in the back had, had broken my front window and bounced out and broke the window of the car behind me. Uh, and the scene kind of looked like this when we were all done, but there was also six other cars involved. So it was a really bad experience. But I was in this old car, and I was more vulnerable than if I would have been in a new car. And I'm starting with this example because when we're thinking of the issue of vulnerability, whether you're thinking of vulnerability doing, being due to living in a big city that's a high-risk terrorist target, or you're you know, in a family that is struggling with poverty, or you have a parent who's incarcerated, or whatever it is that's making your family vulnerable, 
it can be like being in one of these older cars. I mean, there isn't the protection around you that you hope that you would have if you were in a new car. So what I'd like to do today is talk about my journey related to trying to think about how to use science to find a way to support people who are under high stress and in vulnerable situations. And during my career, I've worked in a lot of different kinds of environments, uh, but I'm going to talk about one of them specifically today. But before I do that, I'd like to talk a little bit about what prevention science is. So prevention in this country has been kind of a popular idea for, for really since the founding of the country, but uh, but often the ideas were focused more on kind of issues of philosophy or morality or spirituality. And it was really in the 20th century when people started to think about prevention and research and applying a scientific method to thinking about research and uh, about prevention. And so some of the early work that happened came out of social work and and work that happened around child guidance clinics and the juvenile court in Chicago and, and the sociology movement there and all that stuff. Uh, but in terms of moving towards uh, really rigorous science related to prevention, that kind of got kicked off with the creation by Congress of the National Institute of Men Mental Health right after World, World War II. And one of the first things that happened was the, was the creation of a real small uh, mental Health Studies Center in Maryland that was operated by NIMH. And the idea was to apply public health principles to practice of mental health at the community level. So from the beginning, this included thinking about treatment, but also thinking about how one could prevent problems and catch things early before they had gone all the way to more serious levels. Uh, not long after that, the first training program in mental health consultation started at Harvard. And then uh, during the late 50s, there was a commission on mental health and illness that it ended up publishing uh, this thing, this uh, tome called Mental Health Mantar Trends that uh, a variety of people were involved with, including George Albee, who went on to be president of the American Psychological Association eventually. But um, but that kind of set the tone, and I'll talk about that in a minute. And then really what kicked things off after that was, was the Community Mental Health Centers Act in uh, the year that I was born, uh, which included uh, not only consultation and education and treatment, but also prevention and the mission. So what mental health mentor trends talked about was this idea that there's never going to be enough people to provide treatment services to those in need. That's a problem that we can't solve. So if prevention could be done to lessen the number of people that actually need treatment, then maybe we could provide enough treatment to people who really needed it. And it really did embrace this public health approach and recognize issues such as poverty and the importance of social justice and other issues that play out today in, in the fields that people in this room represent. Um, George Albee went on to found the Vermont Conference on the Primary Prevention of Psychopathology, which brought together researchers for a number of years to talk about prevention. And then during Jimmy Carter's administration, uh, a commission on mental health uh, looked at, okay, where have we come so far since these ideas of prevention in the late 50s? Where are we 20 years later? And the conclusion was not very far. Things are uncoordinated, uh, not enough attention to prevention, and things need to be changed. And so this is when uh, there was a suggestion of really trying to get um, the federal funding of research kick-started, and they recommended establishing a Center for Prevention at NIMH that eventually was established and in 1983 the first prevention intervention research center was funded and multiple ones were funded after that. So that was kind of what kicked started kind of funding at the at the government level but at the same time there was work going on around professional uh, development and kind of bringing prevention science together as a field and so there were a number of conferences and reorganizations that took place and eventually a group called the Society for Prevention Research that was formed and a number of reports and other things that were, that were coming out that kind of 
gave this field a place. And so the focus of prevention science is to think about how do we get to the point where we can develop interventions that focus on people who are dealing with problems, have risk and protective factors that make them vulnerable to having a mental illness, a, a mental disorder, a problem, alcohol use problem, whatever. Uh, and there's three levels that often people focus on, the general population, focusing on people who are at risk for a disorder or focusing on people who actually are kind of very close to developing a disorder but aren't there yet. And the field has kind of gone from thinking about this research cycle which starts with looking at the etiology of disease, then looking at um, longitudinal studies about how disease develops, developing interventions based on those findings, testing them, and then implementing them. And in the course of doing all this, of course, it, it involves fields that are represented in this room as well as many other fields. So it is truly a multidisciplinary field that has elements of all of these fields and others. So it's kind of an exciting field to be in. And there are some prevention science programs. I know you all have a, a, some prevention science opportunities on campus here, but, um, but most campuses don't have that. Uh, so an outcome of all this work over the last decades has been at the moment, we have a variety of programs, prevention programs that have been tested in uh, rigorous ways and that there's some supportive evidence that they're useful. So we call these evidence-based practices. Most of the evidence for those studies comes from studies that were conducted in a university setting like University of Wisconsin where the people conducting the study, designing the intervention, delivering the intervention, testing the intervention are all from the university. They're sufficiently funded to do what they need to do. And so that's called an efficacy trial and researchers are in control. But of course it's an illusion because researchers aren't in control <laughs> about prevention. And uh, there's been a sincere desire amongst researchers who do these trials to really improve prevention services in the field and decrease burden on treatment. But it's a little bit hard to get there from the database that we have now. But there has been this key assumption in the field that we know enough about these prevention programs that we know what works and so we can scale up, um, that people will benefit if we do this. And there are a number of interventions that are you know, meet all these nice criteria that scientists like, like there's a treatment manual and we can train people on how to use it and we can replicate this in various places and it's easy to adapt. So we have all these assumptions. So in some ways, I think some people think about prevention like we're ready to franchise it like McDonald's. You know, McDonald's has a, I don't really like McDonald's myself, but I have fond memories of McDonald's like this growing up in Chicago. I remember one like that. And so that reminds me of that. But anyway, uh, but McDonald's, you know, has it down. They are predictable. If you like what they've got, it's going to taste that way pretty much anywhere you go. Uh, they favor consistency uh, more than maybe some other areas. And they have this very strict fidelity to what you do when you work at McDonald's. This is what you do. And so if you go to a McDonald's in another country, it's going to kind of be that way and you know what to expect. And, you know, so let's take for an example one of their products, French fries, which when I were little tasted pretty good, but then they changed the oil and they don't taste so good in my opinion anymore. But I suppose they're supposed to be healthier, but I don't know. So anyway, French fries. French fries are made out of potatoes, right? Well, potatoes have an interesting role in, uh, in the world because potatoes are a very cheap, relatively highly nutritious, uh, Thing that's easy to grow. And uh, potatoes really helped increase the health of populations in Europe and in Ireland, where many of my ancestors came from. But if you know a little bit about Irish history, you know that the population grew big and then there was a potato famine. And a lot of people died and a lot of people left, including my relatives who came to work in the steel mills in Pittsburgh. Well, why did that happen? In, in Ireland. Well, 
the, populate, the, the potato was useful in Ireland because a family could survive growing a plot of potatoes and having a cow. That was enough to get by for an entire family. And so that, and, and even a poor family could do that and maybe have a little bit of potatoes left over to feed uh, some livestock that they could sell. So it, it really was useful. The problem was that the, that one type of potato was used in, um, in Ireland. And when a fungus came in and wiped out the potato crop, there was no backup. And so this is an illustration of people not understanding the intervention, the potato, very well. They didn't understand kind of core components related to potato propagation, which the potato comes from uh, South America and in the mountains. And people who grew potatoes in South America didn't just grow one type of potato. They grew many types of potatoes. And then if you had an illness that struck one of the potatoes, you had other potatoes that you could eat. So that was a way to build the resilient. But what happened with bringing this potato into Ireland and other places was that you introduced something that looked really good, but it actually made your population vulnerable. And they didn't quite understand why. So when I'm thinking about where we are with evidence-based interventions in prevention right now that are intended to try to help youth and families not experience mental illness or not experience delinquency or, or other kinds of problems, I think about where, where are we really? Are we, do we have a, a potato like the potato that went to Ireland? Or do we have potatoes like the potatoes that were being grown in, in South America where there's a lot of options? And so when I think about implementation and like being ready to move something that was developed by people like us at universities into real world communities, uh, think about the different levels of, of implementation and are people ready to, to implement this great intervention that you have to provide to them. And so part of that is that there's a demand for, for that technology, the intervention. Uh, that there's a decision to commit by leaders who can commit and it's meaningful, so they're ready to adopt. Uh, there, there's groups of people that can put your evidence-based practice into, into action. And then there's, uh, there's something in the context that's going to sustain that. And so when you're coming into a new community and you want to try to work with that community to assist them to try to keep something going and have it be meaningful there, there's pushes. So one is that happens a lot, I think, in, in prevention science is the developer push. And one of the difficulties there is that many of the people who have developed preventive interventions under the model of funding that we have also sell those interventions. And so they are scientists, but they're also business people and they're well-meaning, but they do have financial gain when they sell these things, and it does put you in a, a difficult spot. And this is an example of kind of something related to that. So I was working on Roatan for a while in the country of Honduras. Roatan is an island off the coast of Honduras. Uh, it is, uh, has been... Uh, has many different groups of people that live there, but uh, for a long time there were uh, English that lived there, and the main language on the island is either English or several indigenous languages. It's kind of like the, one of the pirates of the Caribbean islands is for real. And uh, anyway, today most people from the U.S. who know Roatan stop there on a cruise. So if you go on a cruise in the Caribbean, uh, it's not unlikely that you might stop on Roatan because it has the second largest reef in the world and people like to get off the cruise ship and go um, diving on the other side. Well, the interesting thing about that is that when a cruise ship comes into Roatan, they park in a cruise ship port that's fenced and they can buy things from the local people there, but all of those things are profiting the cruise ship company. And then you get on a bus and you drive across the island to the other side, but you travel through 
fenced in areas so you don't actually see the town that you're going through, which is very poor. And then you get to the other side and it looks like you're in some kind of paradise and you go diving, but you'd never understand what it really is like to live on that island. Well, the cruise ship often will leave technology on this island. And this is an example of some of the stuff that they have left there. And they intend to be well-meaning and help the people there. And so this, these, uh, in this collection of stuff there are washers and dryers, are sheets and other things that cannot be washed because the washers and dryers broke down and they don't have money to buy new washers and dryers. And so it turns out that when the cruise ships come in, they'll often give surplus sheets to the hospital. This is at the hospital. And then the sheets are put onto beds and they put plastic on top of the sheets. And so you don't really get to stay on the sheet and eventually the, the sheet gets dirty and then they throw it away. So they're not using sheets as sheets. But anyway, there's this well-meaning kind of, hey, we've got this technology to give you, here it is, but there isn't a way to sustain it. There's nobody that can fix these things when they break. Another uh, force around implementation of the technology is the stakeholders pulling you in and they want you to do something. And there's an awareness that, you know, benefit can happen, but the pressure is like, we want you to do something now. An example on Roatan again is this street that um, looks pretty good if you look down the street this way, but if you look the street up that way where everybody lives, you can't drive up it because it's really rough. Well, why does the street look this way? Well, because of local politicians trying to make things look nice to tourists. Why does it look that way? Because that's how most streets look on this country, you know? So, uh, right now. Ideally, though, when you're trying to implement some kind of intervention, there's this bi-directional idea that you have shared mutual interests, that you recognize together that, that by working together, that could be quite powerful. Uh, but then also there's a danger that maybe if you're trying to push out an intervention, a technology, a prevention, intervention, whatever, that that might lead to really rapid dissemination, but that might compromise the integrity of what you're trying to do. So the approach that we've been trying to do, we as in the team of people that I've worked with over the last 30 years, is to get to the point where we kind of went through our phase of life where we did a lot of efficacy trials and we developed interventions, but they weren't getting uptaked and used. And so what we decided to do was instead of kind of leading where we wanted to go was to look to communities and see where they wanted to go and then try to partner with them. And so the way to do that is that whenever anybody calls me, I pick up the phone <laughs> or if somebody e emails me, I answer. And unfortunately, a lot of scientists are too busy to do that in my state anyway. And so that has led to a variety of opportunities. But what I look for when people contact me is, you know, is there a community, are there practice partners, and are there funders who might be ready to try this preventive intervention, you know, that they're interested in doing. And then once that's down, we usually start from the beginning and think about, okay, what's your target population? What are you really wanting to do? And then let's together go through a process of figuring out how to get from here to there rather than here's the answer to your question, here's what you should do. So often uh, me and my team will go through developing a new iteration of an intervention or sometimes a brand new intervention. But what we always try to get to eventually is to do a rigorous test. And the model that we like to try to do is a randomized controlled trial where you take people who are interested in intervention give them informed consent, they're randomly assigned to receive, you know, one condition or another, and then you follow them up for a long time and see what happens. So that's the, the procedure that we like to use. We have a multidisciplinary research team. We have people from all different kinds of walks of life and all different kinds of training that are on the ta at the table. That when we are thinking about an intervention with a community that we think about multiple sources of wisdom. One is science but another is practice and what people learn through practice. Another is what it's like to be a person dealing with that problem, so being a potential consumer of an intervention. And we try to include all of those levels of people, including another level, which is 
the different people involved in a system that might ha help maintain the intervention, whether that's a government system or a nonprofit system or funders or whatever. And, uh, and then one thing that we've insisted on our, our projects always is that when we do go out to try to do something together with a commitment of doing research that the intervention is never paid for by the research project. It's always paid for by somebody else in the hope that that there's some buy-in and commitment up front rather than just having it all be grant funded because early on in my career I saw way too many things where it was, yeah, great idea, do it, we'd get a research grant, we'd do it, we'd publish some papers and they would sit on the shelf and not go anywhere. Um, so we try to go into these things with the intention that the program will keep going after we develop and test it if it appears to be helpful and if it doesn't, let's go back to the drawing board if they want to. Um, our main hope whenever we do one of these projects is at the very end, people will forget about us. It's not about us, it's about them. So that in the end, it's of and by them rather than by us. So I'm going to give you a little bit of context for this project I'm going to talk about in a minute. So for many years, about 25 years of my career, I worked at a place called the Oregon Social Learning Center, which is a nonprofit research center that was started uh, originally in the early 1960s and um, the part of the center that I became involved with uh, was a group of clinicians who were um, clinical psychologists that worked on uh, issues related to aggression in children and the guy who started uh, the place um, that I was working um, with was originally trained at the Wild Wilder Clinic in Minnesota. He grew up in Ely he learned a more kind of psychodynamic approach to how you deal with kids. And um, then he eventually uh, became the director of this clinic in Oregon, in, in the state of Oregon. This morning I saw somebody getting coffee who had this hat on that said, Oregon lacrosse. And I said, you got a kid at Oregon? Really? And he said, yeah. And I, then after about 10 minutes, I realized it's the town of Oregon, which he called Oregon. <laughs> near here, and it, and it was high school, but their team did really well. So it was, I learned all about it, <laughs> but it wasn't, wasn't my home. But anyway, so a typical case that would come into this clinic was an eight-year-old boy that was having some trouble at home in school, and the parents were kind of at the end, end of their ropes. And so at the beginning of the work, uh, that kid would get play therapy, which my mentor learned how to do at the Wilder Clinic. It was child-focused and didn't really involve the parents at all. So Jerry Patterson is a fellow that I'm, talk, I'm talking about. And what he realized is that the play therapy for the problems he was seeing wasn't very helpful. And so he did a variety of research studies with colleagues and came up to the conclusion that, you know, it's not just about what's inside the child, but also what's going around the child that matters. It seems like that's kind of a no-brainer, but at the time that was the, that was the insight. And it was an important one. And the idea was that what parents, teachers, and other adults do can change what a child does. So Jerry was very much influenced by, by uh, Skinner, that's B.S. Skinner talking with him, uh, by, by a behavioral model. And the therapists that worked on that uh, all developed this uh, model that I'm going to tell about. So, uh, so basically over a period of multiple decades at o OSLC, which is a nonprofit separate from the university. There was uh, basic lab work that led into outpatient clinical work that led into longitudinal studies that led into working in systems. So this is the group that I grew up in and I was involved in a variety of these studies, but we had conducted many different studies with different kinds of vulnerable samples. So kids who were incarcerated, kids who were involved in juvenile justice, kids who were in, in child welfare, kids who were living in higher crime neighborhoods, et cetera, et cetera, kids who just had gone through a divorce and their folks. And uh, so we did a variety of studies where we looked at different kinds of positive and negative parenting practices and how those related to child outcomes and parent outcomes. And over time developed kind of a Bronfen Brenner type of model uh, with kind of different levels of how uh, of influence and, and our focus was on, on the parenting level and working with children. And so uh, the program that came out of our place but also developed at other places simultaneously is called Parent Management Training. 
And it's a cognitive behavioral model that focuses on trying to empower parents and help parents make decisions about what kinds of skills they'd like to use in a given setting with a, a given child. But it focuses on skill encouragement, limit setting, monitoring and supervision, problem solving within families, and positive involvement. So, so over the years, a number of studies were conducted on parent management training at OSLC and elsewhere, and it's now considered one of the two well-established treatments for conduct disorder. And the programs developed at our center have influenced a lot of family-based programs that have ended up on federal best practices lists. So this was an accounting we did a few years ago. And you can see that there are many elements that came out of our group that ended up on other, in other programs. So the primary target in parent management training is to try to help parents find ways that within the context they're living in, they can spend more positive time with their kids, that they can think about um, being involved with their kids and teaching in small steps and thinking about uh, discipline as not this big act that involves a very intense emotion and possibly physical violence, but that uh, discipline is a, is a guidance kind of process that involves little interaction day by day and providing um, little shaping across the day. And to do that, you have to monitor your child well and supervise them, or somebody does. And you have to have a sense of where you're going to go, so goal setting. And you also have to be aware of who your kids are hanging out with and, um, and whether those are the kids that you want your child to hang out with, which is a, a tough issue to deal with. So and every issue on the table here and how you think about it is difficult. There's no doubt about it. But ultimately, the key intervention targets are the presence and behavior of adults and the presence of behavior in peers. So, so that's kind of the background for OSLC modeling. And at our center, we always were very interested in how research informed theory and learn practice and back and, back and forth. So that's the context for this study I'm going to talk about right now called Milos de Manos. So Milos de Manos uh, was uh, a project that came out of that phone call that I told you about uh, earlier with, with Claudia from Guatemala. And, um, and at the time that we got the call, uh, GIZ, which is kind of like USAID, it's an international development um, corporation for the German government, um, had been working in uh, Central America for quite a while around the issue of violence prevention. And as is very much known in the news lately, uh, people in Central America are struggling very much enough that they want to leave their country and go somewhere else. And uh, you can see some of the reasons for that. Very low income, very high levels of uh, fatalities over the last uh, decades, very high murder rates, and uh, interestingly, relatively low prisoner rates compared to our country. But basically, the murder rate and the people killed in the country are 10 to 100 times greater than in our country over the last decades. But our country is very linked to Central America, not only through history and involvement of our country in Central America over many years um, in good and bad ways, um, through commerce, through military bases and interventions, through migration and immigration, uh, through family income that's shared back to those countries from people from these countries who live in the United States, through shared religion, through gang activity, which um, in one version of the story is there because of us rather than the opposite way around, um, and through the illicit drugs that travel up through there and come into here, and then through many aid, government, private, religious, non-religious organizations. So we are very tied in with this part of the world. And these are, these are different folks who are involved in the project that I'm going to be talking about today. So when we came on the scene, the call that I got was that the Germans were developing this multimodal prevention program and had been doing it for a while. And it involved these four stages, developing a community level prevention committee, uh, encouraging community policing, uh, providing adult employment assistance to people as they were going to, from emerging adulthood into adulthood, and then the school and family-based violence prevention. And when they called me, they didn't have anything for this number four. That's why I got the call. And so um, 
the interesting thing about this project is that it, so these four countries are located right next to each other above uh, Costa Rica's down here in Panama and Mexico's right up there. And uh, the Germans had been working closely not only with the governments in each of these countries, but also with the regional governments and also with municipal governments. So they were at the municipal level, the state level, which is kind of more like a county here, the federal level in each country, and then this regional organization. And uh, so when I got the call, the first thing I did was talk to my buddy Charles. So this is Charles and I, and that's in Antigua, Guatemala. But anyway, Charles and I have worked on a lot of projects together, Charles Martinez. And, um, and the thing that we talked about was this idea that, okay, they want our program, but what we need to think about is, is our program the right place to go for them or should they, you know, should they think in a different way about this? And so we were kind of thinking about this kind of model at the time about how important it is when you're thinking about a program to think about all of these different levels. You know, what's the best available research and maybe that leads to your program, but what are the, the characteristics and needs and values and preferences and culture of, your, of the clients you want to work with what resources are available to deliver that intervention and then what is the environment and organizational context. And so that, this model is what, when we were invited to go down there and talk with the Germans and the Central Americans that were part of GIZ, was talking to them about, that's how we think about these interventions and that we also feel very much that we're not the experts. We know something, but the experts in prevention in their community is them. And so uh, we feel like we have something to bring to the table and we hope it's helpful, but we have absolutely no idea how it's really gonna work for them. And so the team that Charles and I put together uh, was a team of people who had experience living in El Salvador, Honduras, and Colombia, many of whom were bilingual and bicultural, and most of whom were in programs like you all in this room. And we all, in a variety of different iterations, had tested uh, interventions, mostly with, uh, related to this population with people immigrating from Mexico to Oregon. And Oregon is a relatively, it has always had a population that's moved back and forth from Mexico to Oregon, but uh, in recent years, the migration has stopped and people stay because they don't want to cross the border anymore. And so it's been a growing, there's been a growing number of people in Oregon who um, come mostly from Mexico, but also from Central America. And from Mexico, they could come from an indigenous background, uh, more Latino background, kind of all over the place. Um, so anyway, um, but the team that we were working with from Germany, their main office was in Sal Sal San Salvador, El Salvador. They had garnered funding from a variety of countries, and they had these, long-term working relationships with the ministries of education in El Salvador, Guatemala, and Honduras in particular, as well as universities in each of these countries. And so uh, what we did was spend about nine months coming up with a plan that was different than what they originally proposed. So they originally wanted to translate our program and spread it around Central America. We said, no, we said that what we wanted was, what we thought would be a better idea to consider would be to hire curriculum writers and program developers in each of the countries involved and start from scratch. So that's, what, what, that's eventually what they agreed to do. So what they were interested in was, um, was developing an intervention that was around youth violence prevention focused on the primary grades. Most children leave school in these countries about fourth or fifth or sixth grade. So the time to do an intervention like this is prior to that. Um, and so the idea was eventually that we would work on a collaborative team with them. Uh, we, would, we would be there as a support, but this would be led by Central Americans for Central Americans. And so this is uh, the team that got set up. And, uh, and this is an example of an, an early meeting. So at this table are people from each of the four countries and uh, all of them, uh, had had experience actually working with mostly international groups that had come in 
to do the model that we were suggesting they not do. So many of them had been hired by the United Nations or other groups to take a curriculum that was in English, translate it into Spanish, and then deliver it as is. So, um, so anyway, what we did over the coming years was uh, act as kind of a conduit of information for this group. We visited uh, their something like down to Central America, a total, I think, something like 12 or 15 times, but these were the visits where our whole team went. So, uh, and the team grew over time. And, uh, and the first task that we had as a team was to try to get, to peop get people to a place where they were thinking a little bit differently, because the request when they came in was, we want to prevent murders. And we had to think, well, hey, let's back up a little bit, and how do you get to that point? And so we, one key thing in prevention science over the years has been to try to focus on what are the precursors of a problem like murder, so what are the risk and protective factors that might set up uh, murder to occur. And you can see that, you know, again, the reason of the focus on murder is that, at, you know, this is back in 2012, you know, the murder rate in Honduras was higher than the, than the number of people that got killed in Iraq at the height of the insurgency. So this is really a tough area to be working in. But we eventually talked with them and looked at a variety of research together that everybody read and that we talked about and came up with a, a model for how youth violence might be generated and what are risk and protective factors along the way and then what might adults do along the way to help mitigate that risk. Along the way, as we talked about different kinds of interventions that had been developed in the United States, the ones that they were most interested in were these three. And um, uh, so these are all kind of multimodal interventions that target youth and families and school environments. And the idea was to consider these in the context of the cultures and communities that we would be uh, working with together in Central America and consider them in the context of the ministries of education, which was the main system that would be involved in delivering these programs. So these programs have some common roots in cognitive behavioral interventions, and so there's connected modes of action. And uh, what, uh, when we were moving along with kind of a theoretical model and, and a potential intervention, we talked about, you know, measurement, and they were very interested in collecting their own data, so we spent a lot of time <laughs> developing measurement and assessment protocols. I remember one particular day where we spent eight hours translating and doc translating into German, two dialects of Spanish and English, 20 items on a questionnaire till we got something that everybody agreed meant the same thing. <laughs> That's an example of the process. It's kind of fun, but kind of hard you know, when you're there for eight hours and it's really hot. Anyway, we eventually developed this program together that involved a component to train teachers and uh, a, po a component to train parents and a component that brought teachers and parents together, which is really important because in the schools that we were working with, rarely did parents and teachers talk to each other. So the idea was how do we bridge what parents and teachers want and get them to, to chat with each other. So that's, those are the three components. And uh, the elements that uh, ended up being in this program were the, the emphasis on not just talking about things, but taking small actions to try to uh, decrease risk and increase protection for youth, whether you're in the classroom or whether you're at home or whether you're on the way between classroom and home, that parents and teachers are the expert and that practicing is essential to skill development. It's not just enough to talk about it and that it's really important for t parents and teachers to be aligned with each other. So uh, we ended up having versions that were developed on some of the key topics that are uh, present in parent management training. And um, the schools that we worked in varied from this school took eight hours to get to from Guatemala City. And at the very end, you had to drive about five miles up a really rocky road, cross the suspension bridge, and walk two more miles. And when you got to the school, there was like 400 kids there but you didn't know where they lived. They just said, come out of the hills, you know, versus a place like this, which is in the city. So we ended up doing about 10 different pilots in small cities, large cities, and very rural areas, in indigenous populations, 
and in, um, in not indigenous populations uh, in the cities, more like Ladino, and then um, and um, so anyway, there's just an amazing amount of cultural diversity, language diversity. So we did these multiple pilots in the four countries, and the idea was we'd do a pilot in one site in one country, then everybody would get together, we'd look at the results of what we'd found, we'd kind of reconsider what the intervention was, and we'd change it. And then we'd try it again, we'd do that over and over and over again until we got to the end. So this took about four years. And in the end, we came up with these materials that uh, have now been used uh, in almost 900 schools across the four countries and uh, have involved about 160,000 students so far. And the program has been adopted as a system wide, as a national strategy in Honduras and El Salvador. So currently, um, GIZ has been funded to continue to do kind of policy discussions at the government level. And, um, and uh, we have been working with them and other collaborators. So for example, Child Fund International used to be called Christian Children's Fund that Sally Struthers did those ads for to adopt kids. I don't know if you remember that if you're older like me. But anyway, that's what that is. But they, they uh, uh, have been collaborating with us on, uh, on proposals lately. And we have a NIH proposal to do a randomized trial in Honduras that got a 10th percentile last two weeks ago. So we're hoping on that one. Uh, and writing papers for journals. So, so that's an example of of how my team together, and I'm just a small part of that, has done projects. And, and I think it has helped build us to a point where maybe someday there'll be an intervention that's like an airplane like this, that's reliable and can get a community where they want to go. But I have no illusions that we're there right now. And so uh, in the meantime, what we have been trying to do and and one of the reasons that I'm happy that I'm here this week um, is that whenever there's somebody who has approached our team that's interested in what we're doing and there's a potential to collaborate and think about how could we take what exists and make it better in a new environment, I'm like really happy that happened and that has occurred here in, in this community. So I'm really excited about that. Uh, but what, what we're trying to do is uh, build on the knowledge base, share findings, and hopefully get to the point where we can kind of encourage replication. And I'd like to end with this little story. So one of the difficult things in doing this work is that it often seems like, uh, you know, you just don't know what's going to happen. So last week, um, one of my colleagues lives in Australia, and he really likes parrots. He grew up in Chicago. His mom still has his parrot. and. Uh, and uh, I've met his parrot when he's home because we do work over the internet a lot. And, uh, but anyway, he sent me this thing and he said, hey, Mark, I heard that there's this parrot that's lost in Eugene. Look for it, you know? <laughs> I said, okay. So I have a story about that. So I thought I might tell you. So over uh, Christmas time, um, we, had a, we had these two budgies that, we'd been, that had been in our home for six or seven years. And one of the hard things I found about parenting is the death of a pet. You know, because usually the person who's there to be there at death and take care of this dead animal is me <laughs> or my wife. And, uh, you know, it's even, even for pets that I haven't really appreciated that much in our house, like rats, which we had a lot of as pets, and actually we're pretty nice pets. Uh, you know, you have to watch the rat die, you know, eventually. It's hard, right? So anyway, we, so we have these two, these two birds that have been with us through a time in our life that was somewhat stressful due to me having to commute to a job, not to New York, but another job for a long time. So these pets were kind of associated with a variety of good and tough memories. Anyway, over Christmas time, one of the birds was really suffering and uh, looked like it was going to die. And so um, it was after Christmas, and I was trying to clean up the Christmas tree and get the Christmas tree out. And you know, all the needles had fallen off and stuff. And I moved the birds into this back room, and uh, and they were kind of having trouble. So I opened the cage to try to help them, and I left the cage open, which normally would not be a problem at nine at night. But anyway, I'm sweeping the needles out of the 
of the uh, living room, and all of a sudden I see this yellow flash go by me out the door. And so the healthy bird just flew out the door, and it's 25 degrees outside. And these birds, the one bird was dying, and now the healthy bird is gone. And that was hard for everybody. <laughs> and I felt awful because it was my fault because I left the door open. So anyway, we spent that night trying to find this bird and to no avail. And uh, the next morning, I hadn't given up. And I went outside and walked around the neighborhood. And I realized that there are thousands of birds that live in our neighborhood. <laughs> and it was very difficult to know if I could hear this bird, but I did hear this very unusual bird sound that I thought was our bird. And I went home and I said to my daughter, who was attached to these birds, I think I heard Rinso's call. So it's Rinso and Snitch, Snitch as in golden snitch. And Snitch, snitch seems like the one that should have got away to catch, but Snitch is the sick one. So, so, so anyway, so I thought it was in this tree. So anyway, we then had five people in my family searching the neighborhood for this bird. And we kept getting sightings all day. We would see the bird. And finally, um, I just randomly happened to be standing in a spot, and the bird flew right next to me, but it was like 30 feet up. And so I called everybody, and I said, I'm standing right here. Bring the cage. You know, I'm going to play a YouTube bird sound <laughs> to try to get the bird to come down. You know, and everything was going really good. And then I knocked on the door, because this was, we've lived in this neighborhood a long time. And this was like five blocks from our house, but I actually knew who used to live in this house. And I knocked on the door. And, and, I, and it turned out those people didn't live there anymore. And there was a, a woman there who didn't speak very good English. And I don't, she, she was, I think, worried that I was there. And I tried to say, no, I, I just want to tell you I have this bird up here. And we're here to get that bird. And so she shut the door quick. So I'm standing there. And then right as everybody arrives, this cat comes across the fence. And the bird takes off. Well, my wife hadn't made it yet, so I called my wife and I said, you know, Carol, the bird flew this way. You know, are you there? And she said, yeah, I'm about there. It was like two blocks over at a certain angle by another big tree. And she actually saw the bird land on that tree. And so then everybody ran across these two blocks. And my daughter, who loved this bird the most, climbed to the top of this apple tree and got the bird to go on her finger. And then she walked down and we got the bird and we brought the bird home to be with the other bird who died that night. So they were together. But my point is that it seemed absolutely impossible to me <laughs> that we would find this bird. But we did because, and we might not have, right? Then it wouldn't be such a good story. But we did and we kept trying, you know? And so often, in these interventions, when you're trying to go through this community process, it kind of th seems like you're trying to find this bird, and there's like absolutely no way that you're ever going to do this, ever, ever, ever. But then you do, you know? So persistence is a good thing. So anyway, that was the last shot of them. <sighs> so those are some thoughts about what I've been doing.